Welcome to NTD News Today. I'm Kevin Hogan. Let's take a look at our top stories. Texas is pushing back, defending sending busloads of illegal immigrants to D.C. on Christmas. That's after being criticized for allegedly abandoning people in freezing temperatures. States' rights versus executive orders. We have more on how some GOP-controlled state legislatures are looking for ways to resist. A Maricopa County judge ruled against gubernatorial candidate Carrie Lake on Saturday, but Lake won't back down just yet. She has filed an appeal. A flight cancellation calamity. Southwest continues to cancel flights through the week, stranding customers, and it's drawing the ire of the federal government. New court documents in the FTX scandal, they say founder Sam Bankman-Fried took millions from his trading firm to buy stock. We hear analysis on potential criminal activity involved. Texas Governor Greg Abbott defends sending illegal immigrant buses to D.C., which arrived on Christmas Eve. And President Biden responds to border policy Title 42 staying in place for now. Texas sent three busloads of illegal immigrants to Vice President Kamala Harris's home on Christmas Eve. Temperatures were in the teens, which led to the White House declaring it a cruel, dangerous, and shameful stunt. A spokesperson for Governor Abbott responded saying President Biden's border policies are to blame and that the immigrants signed voluntary consent waivers upon boarding, agreeing to the destination. She said instead of their hypocritical complaints about Texas providing much needed relief to our overrun and overwhelmed border communities, President Biden and border czar Harris need to step up and do their jobs to secure the border, something they continue failing to do. Back in April, the governor took a similar stance. They've been dumping large numbers uh, of migrants uh, in cities up and down the border, leaving the cities to grapple with challenges they don't have the capability of dealing with. They themselves have been putting these migrants on buses to San Antonio. So I said I got a better idea. As opposed to busing these people to San Antonio, let's continue the ride all the way to Washington, D.C. On Tuesday, Governor Abbott tweeted that so far, Texas has bussed over 15,900 migrants to sanctuary cities. We're providing relief to local communities overwhelmed by President Biden's open border policies. His spokesperson in her statement added that the federal government is processing and leaving immigrants in Texas border towns like El Paso, which recently declared a state of emergency. In an interview published Tuesday night, the mayor of El Paso reacted to border policy Title 42 staying in place, saying the city will continue to take care of those coming in. We'll make sure that we treat them and we take care of them. We want to get everybody off the street to make sure they don't have any, any additional risk on themselves or anyone else. Also on Tuesday, before leaving the White House for family vacation, President Biden commented on the Supreme Court's decision to keep Title 42 in place for now. The court is not going to decide until June, apparently, and uh, in the meantime, we have to enforce it, but I think it's overdue. The president and his wife plan to vacation at the Virgin Islands. He's scheduled to return to Washington on January 2nd, which is the day before Republicans take over the House. Some states are pushing back on presidential executive orders. Republican-controlled state legislatures are weighing their constitutionality. Entity's Daniel Monahan has the story. Executive orders are directives issued by the President of the United States. Article 2 of the United States Constitution affords presidents broad executive authority. It allows them to use their discretion to decide how to enforce the law or to manage executive branch resources and staff. However, some GOP-controlled state legislatures are looking for ways to resist them. Representative Brian Seitz of Missouri is sponsoring a bill that would require state lawmakers to analyze executive orders and potentially to even ignore some of them. Under his proposed House Bill 174, the Missouri House must review all such orders not affirmed by a congressional vote. Seitz says the aim is to determine if they truly are constitutional. Site stated, quote, I am a firm believer in states' rights and am very concerned about losing our authority to federal overreach. Since President Biden was sworn in as president in January 2021, similar bills have been introduced in at least nine other Republican-controlled state legislatures. Those include Alabama, Utah, Nebraska, South Dakota, North Dakota, Oklahoma, Tennessee, Iowa, and South Carolina. 
American Legislative Exchange Council Senior Director Carla Jones says the bills are in response to, quote, federal overreach that infringes on state sovereignty. She says Biden was on track his first six months in office to issue more executive orders than record holder FDR, but has since leveled off considerably and is now pretty equal with President Donald Trump. Executive authority has been a significant issue in state legislatures since the 2020 pandemic. However, the vast majority of legislation has been directed at gubernatorial powers. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. Arizona gubernatorial candidate Carrie Lake has filed an appeal. She is contesting a Maricopa County judge's ruling to dismiss her lawsuit challenging the midterm election results. Lake filed a notice of appeal with the same Arizona Superior Court judge on Tuesday to challenge the dismissal of her case. Lake will also seek a direct review by the Arizona Supreme Court. Judge Peter Thompson first ruled against Lake's election case on December 24th, confirming the election of Katie Hobbs as Arizona's governor-elect. On December 27th, Thompson denied a request from Hobbs in Maricopa County to sanction Lake and her legal team over the lawsuit. The judge ruled that while Lake didn't meet the burden of providing evidence of her election-related claims, her lawsuit didn't meet the standard for imposing sanctions. Pennsylvania's top elections official fully certified results from the November vote late last week. That's after recount petitions in some counties delayed the process. The final tally was issued about two weeks before members of U.S. Congress and state lawmakers were due to be sworn in. The inauguration of the state's next governor will be held later in January. Recount petitions in at least 27 of the state's 67 counties caused delays as some county elections boards waited until litigation was resolved before sending in their certifications. There were concerns about election-related issues across the state, namely in Luzerne County after officials ran out of paper on Election Day. GOP House candidate Jim Bognett issued a statement saying the county should not have certified results due to polling day issues. The Supreme Court is scheduled next week to look at a case from Florida. Former President Trump, Florida, and 16 other states have a request for the court. They wanted to consider whether states have the power to regulate social media companies' content moderation. The case pits the right of individual Americans to express themselves freely online against the right of social media platforms to moderate content. Lawyers say both rights are protected by the First Amendment, so the Supreme Court needs to weigh in to resolve the conflict. Republicans and conservatives have complained for years about being censored by the platforms. In the case at hand, Florida is appealing a ruling that blocked portions of a bill that requires policy transparency and protects user access to platforms. Upon signing the bill, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis said, quote, If big tech censors enforce rules inconsistently to discriminate in favor of the dominant Silicon Valley ideology, they will now be held accountable. The popular China-owned video app TikTok has been banned from all U.S. House of Representatives managed devices. The move imitates a law soon to go into effect banning the app from U.S. government gadgets. The House state of the app is considered high risk due to a number of security issues and must be deleted from all devices managed by it. The new rule follows a series of moves by U.S. state governments to ban TikTok from government electronics. As of last week, 19 states have at least partially blocked the app from state-managed equipment. There are fears that the Chinese regime could use the app to track Americans and censor content. The U.S. House sent a message to staff saying anyone with TikTok on their device would be contacted about removing it, and future downloads of the app were prohibited. U.S. lawmakers have put forward a proposal to implement a nationwide ban on the app. The Senate Judiciary Committee is choosing not to confirm a judge nominated by President Biden. The judge is known for releasing a convicted criminal involved in the shooting death of a boy. Biden nominated Judge Todd Edelman to the U.S. District Court of Washington, D.C. in September. Edelman currently sits on the district's Superior Court. During his nomination hearing, Edelman was questioned about his decision to release Christian Wingfield, a convicted criminal, in 2020. Shortly after his release, Wingfield was involved in the death of an 11-year-old boy. Judge Edelman failed to gather enough votes in the committee. His nomination will expire when the current Congress ends. 
The federal government is investigating Southwest Airlines. They want to find out why the company lagged so far behind other carriers during the holiday winter storm. The airline has canceled more than 12,000 flights since Friday and says it will operate at roughly a third of its capacity for the next several days. And today's Jeremy Sandberg has more on the cancellation catastrophe. You ain't going nowhere. You, you, ain't, you, you ain't going nowhere. Southwest Airlines continued to cancel flights on Tuesday. Around 2,600 more flights were scrubbed on the East Coast by late afternoon. According to the flight tracking service FlightAware, that accounts for over 80% of the roughly 3,000 trips canceled nationwide on Tuesday. Aside from cancellations, many wary travelers were faced with the challenge of finding their luggage. Thousands of bags have piled up in airports around the country, waiting for their rightful owners to claim them. Some customers are more understanding than others. I think it's a time to be kind and generous, and it is what it is. So I'll stand, I'll wait, and it'll show up when it shows up. Southwest didn't want to pay for anything. Um, they didn't want to reimburse me. They didn't want to put me in a hotel, so I dished out extra money to fly with American Airlines, and I finally got here. The cancellations left many passengers stranded who don't have it in their budget to switch to another airline. I think they need somebody, somebody to be able to say something, even if it's a recording telling the people that, what you know, something, you, you know, just to calm them down because everybody's not going to become like me and my daughter. Well, it's an element of surprise. So um, we wasn't uh, anticipating this type of um, calamity, what I would call it right now and the cancellation calamity could continue through the week. Southwest canceled around 2,500 flights Wednesday and nearly 1,400 for Thursday as it tries to restore order to its schedule. The airline's cancellations on Tuesday were 30 times more than the carrier with the second most cancellations, Spirit Airlines. Southwest's CEO Bob Jordan issued a video apology to passengers and employees. He says the main driver of the problem was the winter storm. We're doing everything we can to return to a normal operation. And please also hear that I'm truly sorry. But the federal government wants to know why Southwest is lagging so far behind its competitors in returning to normalcy. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg says the weather problem doesn't explain why the airline can't locate baggage and doesn't even know where its own crews are. As I'm looking at the different airlines, most of them are in the low single digits in terms of cancellation rates, uh, averaging, averaging about 5% for all of the other airlines. Uh, for Southwest right now, we appear to be north of 70%. Buttigieg says federal regulations mandate that in situations where the airline is responsible, vouchers for hotels and restaurants need to be offered without the customer requesting them. He says he talked with the airline CEO about going above and beyond to make things right. A passenger shouldn't have to request that. They need to be proactively offering that. He pledged that they would, and again, we'll be watching to make sure that they follow through. The second vice president of Southwest Airlines Pilots Association says the meltdown was self-perpetuated due to massive reassignment of pilots and a lack of IT infrastructure to facilitate that process. If you look at our competitors, Right here in Denver, uh, United Airlines, for instance, they went through the, the exact same weather system as we did. Um, and they're, A, they didn't cancel as many flights, and B, their recovery is extremely, uh, it's very expeditious versus us. We're still recovering. In Congress, the Senate Commerce Committee has also promised an investigation. Two Senate Democrats are calling on Southwest to provide significant compensation for stranded travelers. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. As Americans and Canadians felt the icy grip of a massive winter storm, some stunning ice sculptures took shape across the Great Lakes. A Scandinavian-themed gift store in Wisconsin was covered in ice. Videos on social media show the wooden building turned into a fortress of ice and snow. The frozen house formed when 60-mile-per-hour winds blew through this area on Lake Michigan. Another video shows a tree covered in ice on the shore of Lake Erie. Last week, the winter storm stretched from Buffalo, New York and its surrounding areas downwind of Lake Erie and Lake Ontario to most of the United States. And coming up, the Justice Department is probing the FTX crypto platform hack of $370 million after the company declared bankruptcy. This is separate from the fraud case against co-founder Sam Bankman Free. A hacker claims to be selling the personal Twitter data of 400 million users. The data in question was stolen from the social media company in 2021. 
More in just a moment here on NTD News Today. Federal prosecutors are investigating an alleged cybercrime that drained more than $370 million from crypto exchange FTX hours after it filed for bankruptcy. The Justice Department criminal probe into the stolen assets is separate from the fraud case against FTX co-founder Sam Bankman-Fried. FTX filed for bankruptcy last month, and Bankman Freed stepped down as chief executive after traders pulled billions from the platform in three days, and rival exchange Binance abandoned a rescue deal. The Justice Department accused Bankman Freed of causing billions of dollars of losses. The FTX collapse has fanned fears about the future of the crypto industry after the beleaguered exchange outlined a severe liquidity crisis. FTX customers filed a class action lawsuit against FTX and its former top executives on Tuesday, seeking to recoup some of the company's dwindling assets. New developments in the scandal involving cryptocurrency exchange FTX, it has a lot of moving parts and complicated backstories, so I wanted to learn more about its inner workings. We hear from a man who was recently named one of the 25 rising stars in tech by Crane's Chicago business. Joining us now for analysis is Robert Salvador, CEO of DigiBuild, which develops construction software utilizing blockchain technology. Robert, it's really great to get your perspective on this scandal. Absolutely. Thanks for having me and happy to talk about it. Court documents show that FTX founder Sam Bankman-Fried took hundreds of millions of dollars from his trading firm Alameda Research to buy Robinhood stock. Break this down for us and what it means in terms of possible criminal activity. Sure. So basically, Sam Bankman Fried was the CEO of a crypto exchange called FTX that really rose to the top of the crypto world the last two years. And what ended up happening was SBF and the company FTX was taking customer funds where customers thought they were buying cryptocurrency and, you know, they were storing or giving money to a crypto exchange to give them cryptocurrency. Well, what was actually happening was FTX was taking those funds and commingling them with their sister company that's called Alameda Research, as you mentioned. And that was utilized to start many different shell companies. As you mentioned, one of those shell companies was used to buy a significant portion of Robinhood stock, which then was used as collateral to buy another crypto exchange called BlockFi here in the US that was looking for a bailout. So BlockFi thought they got a bailout when really it was just more fraud taking place at a much higher level. So what we're seeing right now with Sam Bankman-Fried and FTX really is one of the biggest stories in financial crimes in history. It may go down as the biggest financial crime in history. And you talk about this commingling. How would Sam Bankman-Fried benefit on this? Just briefly. It's no different than in business if you received a check from a partner um, to buy some sort of inventory and you took that check and instead of buying inventory, you went and bought yourself a car or started your own business with money that was supposed to be for your business, for a specific business. So commingling those funds funds was massive fraud and many retail investors and citizens here in the United States were impacted by it in a significant way. Well, Robert, thanks for simplifying this for us. Coindesk later reported that Alameda took out a loan from the firm, pledged those exact same shares, bought as collateral. Can you simplify for us what the implications are of this? So Alameda was a trading firm that was a high frequency trading firm, kind of like you see on Wall Street, that makes money by making thousands of crypto transactions per second. They make a few bucks on the margin, kind of similar to what happens in TradeFi and Wall Street and all that. Well, that's a very dangerous game. That's a high volatility game. So Alameda kept losing and kept basically having, they get margin called. So they would have to pay out all of their lenders and all of their um, creditors or debtors. Well, what happened was Alameda started taking funds from FTX, user funds that were supposed to be protected, user funds that were supposed to be separated at FTX. So basically it was one pile of money and two companies were using it. And then as you mentioned, they cross collateralized things like Robinhood stock. So they showed an account in a ledger and said, look, I have millions of dollars in this ledger. So because of that, let me buy Robinhood stock. And obviously Robinhood, you know, on credit, thought they were good for it, let them buy all this stock. And it turns out the collateral wasn't there. Now this stock is at the center of this controversy 
because many of these people who are owed money, both companies and individuals, are trying to go after that Robinhood stock as a way to recoup their losses. Because as you know, there's over a $10, $15 billion hole in the FTX funds. So people who are owed money are looking for any way they can to recoup some of that. Well, thank you so much for breaking down this really complex scandal. Robert Salvador, CEO of DigiBuild, very good to have you on the show today. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure. A man is accused of trying to steal $110 million by rigging the Mango Markets cryptocurrency exchange. Prosecutors have filed criminal charges of commodities fraud and manipulation. According to a legal complaint, Avraham Eisenberg's trades related to Mango's crypto token enabled him to withdraw $110 million in cryptocurrencies from other investors' deposits. The complaint said by being on both sides of the transaction, Eisenberg artificially inflated the price of Mango's crypto token relative to stablecoin. That allowed him to borrow and then withdraw $110 million of different cryptocurrencies. Mango soon began negotiations with Eisenberg and reached a settlement to recoup $67 million. Eisenberg claimed responsibility for the trading. He also tweeted that he believes all his actions were legal, using the protocol as designed, quote, even if the development team did not fully anticipate all the consequences of setting parameters the way they are. And another leak of personal information on Twitter. A hacker says he is selling the personal data of Twitter users. The hacker claims to be selling the public and private data from more than 400 million Twitter users that was stolen in November 2021. It was allegedly stolen by exploiting a vulnerability that was not fixed until January 2022. Although Twitter fixed the problem, it appears that multiple hackers were able to steal enormous amounts of private information from users before it was addressed. That data contained information from users, including their emails, usernames, account creation dates, and phone numbers. It includes data from 37 celebrities, politicians, journalists, corporations, and government agencies. For much of two years, Tesla buyers who waited months for delivery of their new cars had two options, keep the coveted electric vehicle or sell it at an even higher price to a buyer with less patience. But the days of the Tesla flip may be numbered. That's because prices of used Teslas are falling fast, even faster than those of other car makers. Here's the story. The average price for a used Tesla in November was almost $56,000, down from a July peak of more than $67,000. That's a 17% drop, while the overall used car market posted a 4% drop during that same period, according to data from Edmunds. Over the past two years, rising gasoline prices helped boost demand for Teslas. The company itself raised prices faster than other brands in order to build its profit margins. But now fuel prices are easing, interest rates are rising, Tesla's output is increasing, and EV competition is growing, causing used Tesla prices to fall faster than the market as demand languishes. The company last week offered a $7,500 rebate on both its Model Y and Model 3, doubling its previous discount on each. Tesla shares have plummeted from almost $400 at the start of 2022 down to about $113 on Tuesday. Last week, Musk said that the, quote, radical interest rate changes have increased the prices of all cars, new and used, and that Tesla potentially could lower pricing to sustain volume growth, which would result in lower profit. AMC Entertainment holding CEO Adam Aaron is declining a raise next year as the theater chain operator sees a sharp drop in share value. He said in a series of tweets that he does not want more when shareholders are hurting. He urged other top AMC executives also to forego their hikes. Aaron earned $18.9 million in 2021. Shares of the company have declined more than 75% this year. The rise of streaming and fewer blockbuster releases has led to less customers and seats at AMC's more than 900 theaters. The company has tried to ride out the pressure by rising cash and taking advantage of the retail interest it got during last year's meme stock rally. Earlier this month, the company said it would raise $110 million in new equity capital through the sale of its preferred stock and propose a reverse stock split. 
The cinema chain also said last week it was no longer in talks to acquire some theaters owned by now bankrupt Cineworld Group. The Food and Drug Administration says it will prioritize an over-the-counter opioid antidote. It's an effort to mitigate the ongoing fentanyl crisis in the U.S. The naloxone nasal spray has recently been submitted for review following calls by public health experts and the FDA to make it readily available. Drugs on the review fast track can provide significant improvements in the treatment, diagnosis, or prevention of serious conditions. The synthetic opioid fentanyl is linked to tens of thousands of annual deaths in the U.S. A recent bill introduced in California would require the drug on K-12 school campuses after several students overdosed. The FDA is expected to make a final decision by the end of April 2023. Rescuers use kayaks to reach the pilot of a small plane that crashed into an icy creek. The plane crashed near a Maryland airport and began to sink. Witnesses told Maryland State Police that moments after the plane took off from Lee Airport, they heard it sputter and crash into Beards Creek. A police officer and two people nearby jumped into action using kayaks on the frozen water. News outlets reported that local resident John Jolene Sr. thought the plane would hit his home. Jolene and his son grabbed kayaks and used shovels to skim across the ice to the pilot. The pilot was standing on the wing as the plane sank and stayed afloat by hanging onto the kayak. Jolene said the pilot was very calm. He thought hyperthermia might have been starting to come on. Department of Natural Resources Police arrived on a boat, cut through the ice, and pulled the pilot to safety. He was then taken to a hospital. And still to come, a major car crash in China involving at least 200 vehicles. Authorities say foggy conditions are to blame. And a report shed light on how COVID-19 tracking tools expand government surveillance on a global scale. We'll have the details when we return. We're entering an unprecedented period of economic turmoil. The economy is unstable, our government is in shambles, and the global war on energy has created a domestic crisis. Americans need a way to protect their financial future. One way to ensure your wealth in retirement is by purchasing physical gold and silver. We can help. You can roll any part of your retirement account into a gold or silver IRA. Better yet, you can open a gold or silver IRA in five minutes or less using our online application. Preserving your family's financial legacy is a choice that's always available to you. And when you're ready, we're here to help. Call us and speak to one of our IRA professionals. Let's build your financial legacy together. GSI Exchange, wealth for generations to come. Good to have you back with us. Now turning our attention to China. A major car crash took place there earlier today. It reportedly involved over 200 cars. The crash took place on a bridge in the central Chinese city of Zhengzhou in Hunan province. Chinese state TV said one person was killed in the incident. They attributed the cause of the crash to extremely foggy conditions. Visibility in multiple areas was less than 1,600 feet this morning. Rescuers said more than 200 vehicles had slammed into each other. Footage shared on Chinese social media platform Weibo showed several cars and trucks crumpling and piling on top of each other. Many of the injured were trapped in their vehicles, and the fire department sent 11 fire trucks and 66 personnel to help. The COVID crisis in China. One official from the Chinese CDC has made a prediction and big losses at two of China's most prestigious universities. Are the deaths COVID related? Here's NTD's Tiffany Meyer with the story. One peak and three waves. This is the prediction from Wu Chunyong, chief epidemiologist at the Chinese Center for Disease Control and Prevention about the current COVID-19 outbreak in China. Who said the first wave would span from mid-December 2022 to mid-January 2023, mainly in cities. 
The second wave will strike from late January to mid-February 2023, China's top travel season surrounding the Lunar New Year holiday. The third wave is expected from late February to mid-March, when people return to work after the New Year holiday. The peak outbreak is predicted to span three months in total. Earlier this year, Wu also advised Chinese citizens on how to avoid monkeypox. One of his recommendations, having no contact with foreigners. Chinese authorities had already announced the first case of monkeypox in China before he gave the warning. The initial infection case was said to have originated outside China. Due to the Chinese regime's history of underreporting and covering up health data, it's unclear if that case was actually the first discovered in the country. Two of China's most renowned universities are suffering an unusually big loss. Their teachers and professors are passing away. One of the universities is considered the birthplace of the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP. The other one is known for its high-profile alumni, including the current and former CCP leaders. Twelve professors from Beijing University died this month. That's according to notices put out by the school. Three of the university's retired professors passed away on December 22nd alone. According to its website, the university maintains strong links to the Chinese Communist Party. The first group of communists and Marxists in China were educated there. The second school is called Tsinghua University. The death toll for its retired professors totaled 87 in just the last four months of this year, double the figure from the same period last year. This university also holds an important place in the CCP's recent history. Most of China's top leaders over the past decades are alumni, including current Chinese leader Xi Jinping and former leader Hu Jintao. The CCP leader before Hu Jintao did not attend the school, but his prime minister did. It's unclear if the deceased persons tested positive for COVID-19 or if they were even tested for the virus at the time of the death. Most of the death notices list illness as cause of death without any specifics. One notice listed a, quote, heavy cold as the cause. The deceased person was the designer of the 2008 Beijing Paralympic mascot. And now, in response to the virus outbreak in China, the U.S. is considering new rules for travelers from China. U.S. officials said Tuesday it's over concerns about the lack of transparent data coming from the Chinese regime. Earlier this week, Japan, India, and Malaysia announced tougher rules on travelers from China. And global fears of the COVID-19 pandemic are receding, but new concerns rise over information tracking tools designed to combat the virus. A recent report uncovers how these technologies have helped expand governmental power to silence dissent and target minorities. As the pandemic took hold in early 2020, Authorities ramped up the use of tracking tools to contain the virus. Personal health data, photos and home addresses were widely collected. But an Associated Press report is sounding the alarm over swelling government surveillance built on these tools, citing investigations from around the world. In China, a national health code app has been used to silence dissent. At the core of Beijing's zero COVID policy is a mobile app that generates a personal QR code. Citizens can only board public transportation when their code is green. If they have close contact with individuals testing positive for COVID-19, their code will turn red, meaning they will be confined to their home. But in the past three years, evidence suggests authorities have rigged the code red to restrict dissidents or protesters from traveling, even when their virus tests showed negative. Human rights activists warned the app could stay as a means of social control, despite China's easing of lockdowns. As part of a citizen's rights, we have a right to privacy. This is one of our rights. Where are the rights to privacy under this condition? There are no such rights. They can collect personal information arbitrarily. Last year, hundreds of Arabs in Jerusalem received threatening messages from the country's Shin Bet security agency. The recipients were suspected of participating in violent clashes with police between Palestinian militants and police in the Gaza Strip, though many of them were simply living, working or passing through the area. Just imagine that you receive such a text. You don't have any uh, option to reply, to address the allegations. This is, uh, for us, 
um, something that is unacceptable in a democracy. In India, authorities used facial recognition to enforce mask mandates, capturing images by surveillance camera and police patrolling the streets with tablets. SQ Masood is a social activist who led a government transparency campaign in Hyderabad. Last year, he was randomly stopped by police. The officers asked him to remove his mask so they could take his picture. When Masood refused, they took a picture with his mask on. He has filed a lawsuit to find out why his picture was taken. Whether it be the use of facial recognition technology or the net of CCTV cameras they have blanketed this city with, all these technical solutions being used by the police and governments are very scary for the common people. It is especially scary if you're a minority or Muslim living in the current political scenario. In Australia, data collected during the pandemic was used for other purposes. In 2020, Australia's intelligence agencies were caught passively collecting data from the National COVID Safe app. An inspector general said there is no evidence that the data was accessed or used. But at the local level, law enforcement have used citizens' location sign-in data to investigate crimes. John Scott Railton is a senior researcher at the Toronto-based internet watchdog Citizen Lab. He commented, any intervention that increases state power to monitor individuals has a long tail and is a ratcheting system. Once you get it, it is very unlikely it will ever go away. And if you have any news tips or feedback for the show, don't hesitate to email us at news.today at ntd.com. And just ahead, Kosovo shuts its largest border crossing with Serbia after protesters blocked it. That's amid escalating tensions between the two Balkan countries and Russia and China stepping up cooperation near Taiwan. The two countries held a joint exercise in the East China Sea. More shortly here on NTD News Today. Tensions are flaring up in the Balkans. Kosovo has closed its biggest border crossing with Serbia. This came after protesters blocked the road to reject Kosovo's independence hours after Serbia put its army on high alert. The protesters were ethnic Serbs living in Kosovo. The Maldare entry point is the most important entry point for road freight to Kosovo. Last night, the protesters used a truck and tractor to set up a roadblock near the crossing. Earlier this month, two other crossing points were closed due to similar protests on the Kosovo side. That means only three entry points are now open between the two countries. With Western support, Albanian-majority Kosovo declared its independence from Serbia in 2008, but about 50,000 Serbs living in northern Kosovo refused to recognize the government or Kosovo's status as an independent state. They regard Belgrade as their capital. The Kremlin has said it supports Belgrade. Russia and China completed a joint naval exercise near Taiwan today, marking an escalation of their cooperation in the Pacific. It lasted for a week in the East China Sea. The exercises included a drill on capturing enemy submarines with depth charges, as well as firing artillery at warships. It was called the Maritime Interaction 2022 and was carried out in waters off China's Zhejiang province. This is a province close to Taiwan and Japan. The Russian Defense Ministry published video showing a group of Russian and Chinese warships in the East China Sea. It also showed Russian sailors speaking in Mandarin to their Chinese counterparts. According to Russian media, Chinese regime leader Xi Jinping is due to speak to President Vladimir Putin before the end of the year. President Putin is banning oil supplies to certain countries. He signed a decree on Tuesday. The ban will apply to countries that introduce price caps on Russian oil and petroleum products. The decree said the established ban applies at all stages of supplies to the final buyer. The ban on oil supplies will be in effect from February 1st to July 1st, 2023. However, the date of the ban on petroleum products will be determined by the government. Moreover, the head of state can issue a special permit for the supply of Russian oil and oil products prohibited by the document. Western oil sanctions came into force on December 5th. That's after the European Union and Australia agreed to a $60 per barrel price cap on Russian seaborne crude oil. A Russian politician died suddenly in a hotel in India last week. He reportedly criticized Moscow for the war in Ukraine. Indian police are currently looking into his death. 
Pavel Antov was a member of a regional parliament in Russia. His body was found Saturday at a luxury hotel in eastern India. The man was on vacation there with three other Russian nationals. Police said he appeared to have fallen from a terrace to his death. Just a few days earlier, one of his three companions was found dead, apparently of a heart attack at the same hotel. Police are waiting for the autopsy report, but say there are no signs it was a crime. In June, Russian media accused Antov of criticizing the war in Ukraine, which he denied. The Secretary of State is recommending to a pledge to bring American Paul Whelan from Russia home, the fourth anniversary of Whelan's detention. Whelan is serving a 16-year sentence in a Russian penal colony after his arrest on December 2018 on espionage charges, which he's denied. U.S. officials have declared him wrongfully detained. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said today that Whelan's detention remains unacceptable and U.S. officials continue to press for his immediate release at every opportunity. He said his and the president's efforts will not cease until he's back with his family. The Biden administration was unable to secure Whelan's release when they brought WNBA star Brittany Griner home in a prisoner swap in mid-December. And still to come, archaeologists in northern Spain unearth a bronze hand with an ancient inscription. Find out what language it's in and how much has been translated. A museum exhibition embedded in a subway station. Outside of Athens, crowds are able to look through a glass beneath their feet at an ancient mosaic. Stay tuned for more on that when we return. A performance that truly matters for each and every one of us. This is what you've been waiting for. See it at least once in your lifetime. Get tickets now at ShenYoon.com. The Fixture Pioneer, CGM. Professional AI intelligent fixtures. All-round integration of four systems. High precision, high durability, high quality. 2 micrometer repetition accuracy, more than 80 patent certificates, ISO 9001 approved. Precision clamping to meet your every need, CGM has it all. Pride of Taiwan, CGM. Over in Argentina, at least two people were injured when a tree branch fell in a garden. The incident took place at the Buenos Aires Japanese Gardens on Monday. Footage captured by a visitor shows the moment the branch crumpled and toppled down. Visitors who ran out of the way immediately came back to assist those who the branch hit. Local media reported two people suffered minor injuries. Investigators in northern Spain have discovered an inscription in an ancient language. It's believed to be the oldest written record of what is now the Basque language. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the details. Archaeologists unearthed a piece of bronze last year with a mysterious inscription. Researchers think it's the earliest known evidence of a written Vasconic language. The dialect was a precursor to the Basque, still spoken in parts of northern Spain and southwest France. La pieza... The piece is a bronze plate that has the shape of an extended hand and that has text written in Paleo-Hispanic characters and in the Vasconic language. That is what is really surprising. In other words, that it constitutes the first document undoubtedly written in the Vasconic language and also written in a script that probably is also a specifically Vasconic script. The Vascones were an Iron Age tribe centered on territory that makes up Spain's modern Navarra region. Linguists widely believe that the Vascones only started writing after Roman invaders introduced the Latin script. The discovery of the bronze could challenge that belief. It is a text whose appearance or whose discovery we did not suspect could have happened, because we were almost convinced that the Basques were illiterate in antiquity, that they learned to write very little with the Iberian language, to mint some coins, and then they acquired the writing of the Romans, and therefore the Latin alphabet. 
Archaeologists believe the bronze hand was designed to hang on a door, likely as an amulet of protection. So far, linguists have been able to translate only one of the words inscribed on it, fortunate. It is a text of welcome, a text of wishing good fortune for the inhabitant of the house, or for the one who arrives to the house, etc. Basque has survived for centuries despite the common use of Spanish and French. Several hundred thousand people are estimated to speak the language. It is most commonly spoken in the Spanish Basque country and Navarra regions. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. In a subway outside Athens, commuters can look down through a glass floor. Beneath their feet is a mosaic from the 4th century B.C. NTD's Andrew Thomas has more. These aren't visitors to a museum. They're passengers on a new subway line. The passenger will be given a small taste of an everyday moment in an ancient house. Just like his own everyday moment when he passes through here, a house, that is exactly beneath his city. And in this way, we plant something pleasant in his daily life. Something creative and new, something else. Something he can think about when he is taking the train. The mini exhibition of artifacts is embedded in the structure of the station. It features items found during construction. Working at a depth of as much as 60 feet, the archaeological excavation spanned 10 years. It ended with a total of six new stations. The most significant thing for us was that we saw all these small objects, tools, parts of furniture, which we don't know about. And at this moment, we are still not sure what a lot of them are used for. A huge field of research has opened up before us. Evangelos Kolovos is the project director for Attica Metra. One find in particular still resonates with him. I was uh, very moved in some cases. I remember once I was in the um, excavation and at that time they found a small ancient ring. It was also challenging. The construction team had to adapt to archaeologists' needs while not delaying or increasing the cost of the project, which already cost $700 million. With so much history, building underground subway lines in Greece has always been a delicate issue. There's always a way. There's always a way. There's no uh, any problem or uh, any difficulty that cannot be overcome. It's a delicate balance between preservation and progress. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Coming up, we visit a specialist bookshop in London known for its rare antique maps and atlases. And what are some of the children's books worth reading for a family celebration in the new year? We'll be back with more soon here on NTD News. Google Maps may be available to nearly everyone in the world today, but it wasn't always that way. Maps and atlases served as navigational aids going back millennia. Entities Malcolm Hudson paid a visit to a specialist rare bookshop in London known for the sale of the most expensive map ever sold on the open market. I'm here with Eleanor Napoleone at Daniel Crouch Rare Books, and she's going to be showing me some early atlases from around 500 years ago. So, Eleanor, could you please explain to me a bit about these atlases? Of course. So, we're going to be looking at a 1486 uh, Isolario, which is an island book, the first sea atlas that was ever published. Uh, it was made by Bartolomeo d'Alissonetti. And then we will look at a 1525 Ptolemaic Atlas, which was published in Strasbourg. Based in St. James, London, Daniel Crouch Rare Books specializes in antique atlases, maps and sea charts. They have a unique selection and were responsible for the sale of the most expensive map ever sold on the open market, priced at $10 million. Though both these atlases are around the same age, the Isolario is unique in that it was not based on the maps of Ptolemy, the Greek cartographer. Ptolemy lived in the 2nd century AD and expounded the theory that the Earth was the centre of the universe. The author, Bartolomeo Dali Sonetti, says he was the captain of a ship and travelled the Mediterranean. And so drew the, map, drew the maps of the islands from uh, travelling uh, around them. And this is very important because the only other um, 
uh, atlases from the time were all Ptolemaic atlases. In a twist of mystery, it's not known who exactly Bartolomeo dalli Sonetti was. His chosen surname translates as of the sonnets because he wrote sonnets about the islands. In contrast, the Strasbourg map is based on Ptolemy, but also goes beyond him. This one has uh, some modern maps, and the most important fact about this book is that it has uh, the first woodcut map to name and show America. Among the selection of globes and charts is a stunning map of China from the Qing dynasty. This showed the empire's people where they were in the world and that they were part of something greater, and it's accompanied by an astronomical chart, positioning mankind within the cosmos. In a time of digital maps, these items seem like relics from a distant past, but they also mark the rich history that has brought us to today. Malcolm Hudson, NTD News, London. Cultural traditions make a big part of holiday celebrations, especially for kids. Let's take a look at some popular children's books from 2022 and draw some inspiration for a family reading list. Artist specializing in children's books. Prostate health is important for every man, so let's get some diet and lifestyle tips to improve it. Here's Gina Marie, who brings us Strong Mind and Body. Prostate problems have become one of the biggest health issues for men today. Lifestyle and poor diet are known risk factors for developing prostate problems. All men are susceptible. Remember that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Let's look at what to avoid, starting with refined carbohydrates. Avoid white bread, white rice and sugars. Sugar feeds cancer, that's the problem. Processed foods and seed oils are bad news for the prostate. Stick to a diet mostly of quality organic and non-GMO whole foods. Let's look at nutrition for a healthy prostate. Whole fruit and vegetables contain fiber, minerals, vitamins and antioxidants to ensure that the prostate stays healthy. Here are just some of the superstars when it comes to prostate health. Vitamin D. This vitamin is extremely important as most of us in North America are deficient. Multiple studies show that vitamin D deficiency is linked to multiple types of cancer including that of the prostate. Get your vitamin D from safe moderate sun exposure and a supplement especially in the winter months. Tomatoes and lycopene. Tomatoes are fabulous for prostate health. They contain an antioxidant compound called lycopene. Most studies and research have shown that men whose diets contain the highest amounts of lycopene have the lowest incidences of prostate cancer. Cooking tomatoes releases the lycopene. Also, be sure to stay away from canned tomatoes and eat fresh whenever possible. The BPA lining of the cans is a concern due to the acidity in the tomatoes. 
Don't like tomatoes? In that case, try red or pink grapefruit and watermelon. Next is pumpkin seeds and zinc. The mineral zinc is needed in abundance in the male prostate. Zinc deficiency is very common. Zinc in the prostate helps to fight infection and a deficiency can lead to BPH. It has been shown to shrink an enlarged prostate. A great source of zinc is raw pumpkin seeds. Alternative sources are grass-fed beef and cashews. And let's not forget cruciferous vegetables. Eat more vegetables from the cruciferous family of vegetables. These include Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, kale and broccoli. They contain phytochemicals that appear to be protective to the prostate gland. And let's not forget omega-3s. Omega-3s reduce inflammation in the body and therefore help to reduce inflammation in the prostate gland. You can get your omega-3s from wild-caught salmon. If you don't eat fish, they are also in walnuts and freshly ground flax seeds. My favorite, green tea. Green tea contains an antioxidant called EGCG that helps to fight abnormal cancer cells. Research has shown a link between green tea consumption and lowered risk of advanced prostate cancer. The New Year's Eve ball in Times Square has an update. New Waterford Crystal Triangles have been installed. They are set to be a key part of the famed ball drop ceremony this year. Every year, millions of eyes around the world turn to the New Year's Eve ball in Times Square, counting down the last few seconds of the year. The crystal ball is 12 feet in diameter and weighs more than 11,000 pounds. The sphere contains more than 2,600 Waterford crystal triangles. The shapes are anchored to an aluminum frame and illuminated by LED lights. The ball is able to display more than 16 million vibrant colors, points in billions of patterns, forming a spectacular scene on the roof of one Times Square. This year, over 190 crystal triangles have been replaced. The new crystals represent the theme of 2023, the gift of love. You can see these intertwining beautiful love hearts on this cut on both sides, designed by Irish craftsmen. And this is what's really special about this. And this is part of this brand new theme, greatest gift, the gift of love. We need this after the pandemic. We've all gone through a horrendous two years. We've come out the other side of it and we've come out better. We surround ourselves with love. We've got everything. Each year, Waterford's Irish artisans handcraft these crystals for this special occasion. This year marks the 10th year of the Greatest Gift Crystal Collections. Since the pandemic outbreak in 2020, in-person viewing of the iconic ball drop has been subject to varying degrees of restrictions, but this year they've all been lifted. The crystal ball will drop from the top of one Times Square on New Year's Eve, ringing in the sparkling start of 2023. That's all for today's program. We're really glad to have you with us. Please send us an email if you'd like to tell us something. We're going to put it on screen. For podcasters, that's news.today at ntd.com. I'm Kevin Hogan, NTD News, New York City. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.